here what's really crazy. Almost every day since last Sunday, we heard the song, Don't Stop Believing. Almost every, I think one day, we did not hear it. I think. And, and we kept on looking at each other like, what, what is that? Is this confirmation that we're doing the right thing? Because, man. So, yeah, when you're, in, when you're in other countries and you hear people singing, Don't Stop Believing by Journey, it's like, what? You know, walking through the ship, karaoke in the middle of the ship, and somebody's saying, don't stop believing. It was just, it was just like that, over and over and over. So um, it's just funny how that happens. And then, you know, last week I introduced Pastor Dale as my friend, and then he gets up here and steals my sermon. I don't know. I mean, it's like, you got to realize that I already wrote this sermon before he came. And so it wasn't exactly the same, but maybe I could say that I've kind of been preaching this same sermon for over two years now, right? And maybe it was another one of those confirmation things that Pastor Dale comes and, and speaks a message like he brought us last week. But with that said, I, uh, I want to start with a short commercial. Next week is the first week of December. And with the first week of December comes the first week, Sunday of Advent. Now I realize some of you are like, wait a minute, December? What happened to the rest of the year? <laughs> right? I and mean, that's kind of where I'm finding myself. I remember when I was younger, my mom used to tell me all the time, you know, when you get older, the days go faster. She didn't say that the years went faster. And they're going fast. Well, Advent begins next week. And Advent is the beginning of the church calendar. So it's kind of like January 1st for most of us, right? It's, it's, the, it's the beginning of the church calendar. It's when everything starts over for the church year. And it's a time to celebrate the coming of our Lord. It, that's really the focus, right? Because everything starts with the coming of our Lord. So, I tend to get a little excited about Advent. I, I only hold on to a couple of different things on the church calendar and I hold them tight. Advent happens to be one of those. And so, we're going to be focusing on what our coming Lord means to us over the next few weeks. So let me encourage you to bring some friends or neighbors or people that you just bump into as you're out running around doing all the things that you're going to be doing for this Advent series. You see, I know and most of you know that God is moving here at CCNet. And I believe that He has some incredible stuff to show us over this next year. I'm always excited to start a new thing. You know that now some of you have gotten close enough to me to realize that I really I am one of those very weird different people because when you say change I'm like in let's go I like to change uh, you don't know me like I used to be I used to have more hair so I used to like shave my head or grow a flat top or I might have longer hair uh, same thing with my beard, and I still do that occasionally. Uh, I just like to change things up about every, you know, two or three weeks. I'm just like that. I don't like anything to be status quo. I don't like anything to be stagnant. I don't like anything to not be moving. So we're in this, we're in this thing right now, right, where we're, we have a, a coach who's coaching us on how to bring a church to the next level. And so... In that, we, we are coming up on our six months. Actually, we just passed our six months. And, our, and so it's going to cost some money for the next six months. You know, when you start doing that money thing, it makes you chant, check. Is this really something I want? And so I've been talking about this a lot with Barb. And, and like, so, yeah, it's good. But do we need to keep doing it? It's going to cost us money. Uh, it's probably going to come out of our pocket. I don't know. What should we do? And, and, and so all of that, I realized that sometimes you just have to 
take that step and let it go, right? I want to see everybody change overnight, right? I mean, I can shave my head, grow my beard, whatever. My beard grows in about four days, so I have to shave it about every four days, about how often I shave. And so, um, you know, I, I change quick and my mind changes quick, so I want to see everything else change quick. I want to see all of you so on fire for the Lord that you cannot be quiet, you cannot sit here, so you're just jumping up and screaming, Hallelujah, I need Jesus. And then we go out of here, outside, and you're like telling people, you got to come to Nazarene Church. I mean, if you don't come, you're missing out. There's so much happening right there. You need Jesus. Oh, you don't know Jesus. Well, let's pray. Right? I mean, that's, that's where I am. And so... This idea of things that need to change quick. You know, I haven't even started my sermon yet. You guys ready? <laughs> Woo! All right. <laughs> so I just, I'm excited about new things. And, and new things get me riled up like this very often. So I just want to challenge you. Can we do this right this year? Can, can we start this year with as many people as we can get to come and hear what God's doing? I, I have this vision. I, I have lots of visions. They're usually way too big to understand. But I have this vision that on Christmas, our Christmas Sunday service, that we have 300 people squeezing in. I want to see 300 people here. But you know what? It doesn't matter how many people I invite. I'm never going to get that to happen by myself. So, I don't know. Maybe you guys could come a part of that. Be a part of that. Pastor Barb often shares about how um, she listens to Pastor Stephen Furtick as she walks. Right? She, she likes to walk around the track over there. It's, I don't know. I think it's called Deltona Park or something like that over on Deltona. And she listens to Pastor Stephen. And I also listen to him every once in a while. My favorite story that he tells is about when he and a few friends piled into a couple cars and moved to Charlotte, North Carolina to start Elevation Church. You see, Elevation Church is a huge church now, but it was planted at one point by just a few people. And he tells the story, he says, after they had had services a couple weeks, he's standing in the pulpit and he looks out and he sees all of the people that came with him to Charlotte to start a church. Nobody else, but all the people that came with him to Charlotte to start a church. Well, that's what you would expect, right? I mean, they're two weeks in, everybody just moved to town, and he looked at him and he said, don't come back to church next week unless you bring somebody with you. That's pretty bold. Don't come back to church unless you bring somebody with you. But if we really want to see this church grow, we need to understand or consider what that says. Pastor Stephen is saying to his friends, to his friends who really believe in him, they really trust him, they moved with him. He's saying to them, it's up to you to build this congregation and make it what God has called us here to. It's up to you. So the question becomes, are you and I willing to step up to the plate and help build CCNAS? If so, bring someone with you next week. Right? You notice that I left out the first part of that. Okay. okay. I want to see you all here next week. That's why I cleared it up a little. So now let's return to our normally scheduled programming, okay? <clears throat> We've been talking a lot about the miracles Jesus performed while he walked the earth these last couple months. And as we approach Thanksgiving, it seems appropriate that we talk a little bit about food. Don't you agree Thanksgiving food that goes together? I know I, I really like food. You know, I, I really like food. Honestly, I'm sure that I like it a little bit too much. I, I was just on a cruise ship, as I said. 
and there's like endless food. I did much better than I thought I would. But it doesn't mean that I didn't do bad at times. And so I like food. And, and Thanksgiving has been my favorite holiday for many years. Now, when I make a statement like that, it sounds like I'm saying that my favorite holiday is about food, right? But the truth is that I really like Thanksgiving because it brings families together. It, it's, it's the holiday that seems to bring everyone back home. And, and even though I don't go home anymore, it's cold up there, uh, I still enjoy being with part of my family. Thanksgiving becomes a time to gather with the people that you love, to share a meal and good conversations, right? And it's often while we're gathered around the table. Please pass through the mashed potatoes. Isn't it exciting that your new pastor is coming into town soon? Aren't you interested in how he or she is planning to to bring some new life into the church. Would you, would you have that salt and pepper? Hey, I'm sure the kids are excited about Christmas. Have they given you any indication of something that maybe we could buy for them? Wow, this turkey is amazing this year. Would you just put a little bit of that dark meat on my table, on my plate? Isn't that how our conversations go? I know ours do. We're like all the ends of, so we're all scattered pretty heavily. Uh, that's not true. There's some Pinellas mixed into there and some Chineskis and there's others, but they don't really count because they've married in Leandas, so now they're us. So, right? So we're like all over the place. In case you hadn't noticed when you're talking to me, uh, I'll be talking to you and then I'm looking over there. And I try so hard not to do that. Because I know what that makes you feel like. It's not intentional. I don't know why. I can't keep my brain stuck on one thing for very long. It's that change, maybe. That change thing. I don't know. I'm not going to make an excuse for it. But we often take some of these things for granted. And abundance of food is one of those things that we take for granted. I mean, it's nice to have the opportunity to share a meal like this with our family and friends, right? And I know that I'm guilty of overeating during almost every Thanksgiving meal I've ever attended. But sometimes people don't have that luxury. Sometimes people don't even get to eat. And this happens on a lot more days than just Thanksgiving, right? We know that. I want to share a reading from Matthew chapter 14 verses 15 through 21 today. I'm going to be reading out of the New International Version. Would you please stand in honor and reverence to the Word of the Lord. It says this, As evening approached, the disciples came to Him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. You can be seated, and let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenges that you give us and the way that you open our minds to receive what you have for us. So God, today, I pray that we would all receive exactly what you have for us. I pray, God, as I prepare, as I try to bring this message that you would hide me in the shadow of your cross, that every word I speak would come from you and nothing would come from us. 
But just in case, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would watch over each one of us, would guard our minds and help us to only receive what you have for us today. And help us, Lord, to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I felt like this was the right passage to share on the Sunday before Thanksgiving because it talks about food. No, that's not really the reason. It's, it makes sense to me that we would be talking about a miracle that Jesus did, that Jesus was a part of, that happened and, and that we can all sort of relate to in some way. We're finishing this, this series on on Don't Stop Believing today. And, and I just wanted to end with something that most everybody has heard. Most people that I've known, that I've run into, even those who don't necessarily attend a, serve, a church service, have heard about Jesus feeding people. And so it just made sense to me that we would end this series with this sermon. But it also made sense when you start thinking about Thanksgiving. Right? Let me start by asking you to think a little. Have you ever found yourself drawn to something so strong that you just knew you needed to be in the middle of it? No. no. Is there anybody here? Hello? Okay. I, I'm not used to that. Somebody usually answers me if I ask a question. Uh, I mean, have you ever been in a place where someone shared a vision and you felt like you had to be a part of making it happen. Or maybe it was that someone offered you a chance of a lifetime and you were in the right place to get in on the ground floor. Our, our science teacher, high school science teacher, used to tell a story of his grandfather in an alley. I don't remember what city. I think he was in Chicago. And a guy came up to him, getting dark, you would think, no, this is a bad thing. It could be really bad. And the guy came up to him and said, hey, man, I have this idea, and I just need some investors. Are you willing to get with me, invest with me, and we're going to make this thing good? And his grandfather was like, eh, no, I'm not going to do that, and walked away. The guy went on to start Coca-Cola. His grandfather regretted that conversation for a really long time. You ever find yourself in the right place at the right time and you have the opportunity to get in on the ground floor, right? Or maybe you've been reading a magazine and the words of an article jumped off the pages straight into your heart. And, and you knew for sure that this was meant for you to read so you could get busy making it happen. That's what I'm talking about today. You see, I've had that happen to me a couple times. Once was when I found myself hearing God say, I want you in full-time ministry. You see, I had spent a lot of years saying, I know God, I'm doing ministry. I know I'm just getting paid from this job. But I'm doing ministry, God. I, you should be really happy with all that I'm giving you. Right? And he kept on saying, ah, I want more. I want you full time. I want you all the way. Everything you have, jump in. I really feel like just because Dale came down, I was like this, all the way in, in the part of the service. I want to be, I want you in it. Right? Right? He, he was like, I want you in it. And I, and I just couldn't quite get that. I was, I was struggling with that. And that was one of those times when I really wasn't looking for more. I wasn't asking him to give me more. I wasn't, I mean, yes, I wanted to be closer to him, but don't ask more of me. And, and the other time was when I happened, with my wife's help, to find a way to go to Bible college. You see, Bible college, I had gone to a, a local kind of uh, extension of the Bible college, but they were stopping that. And, and I was kind of at a crossroads. Am I going to just move? What am I going to do? How am I going to continue my education? And, and this little, I don't know, it was small, maybe one inch by three quarter inch ad in the bottom of the Herald of Holiness. They don't even have that anymore. It's not called Holiness Today. Uh, 
a little magazine that comes out from the Nazarene, just this little thing in the bottom right hand corner. It said that the Nazarene Bible College was going online. You see, these things, they just kind of happen. And, and I, I wasn't looking for them. I wasn't, I, I had my eyes closed actually to them and, and I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking of what I was going to do next, where I was going next. The people in this passage of scripture have found themselves in a desolate place. A place where they can't take care of their own needs. I mean, they haven't eaten all day. And the closest McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's are all miles away. I mean, they just can't just go through the drive-thru. They can't even call for pizza. Right? They need some nourishment. But they also know and want to hear from Jesus. As, as, as much as possible, they want to hear from Jesus. And they don't want to leave because they don't want to miss the best or most important lesson that he has to offer them. And they don't know if it's coming or if they've already got it. See, they're in the middle of the important stuff. And, and they know they want more of Jesus' teaching. And so they'll just go hungry because they don't want to miss what Jesus has for them. But the disciples, they realize this is the case. And so they, they ask Jesus to dismiss the crowd. The disciples know that if Jesus tells the people to go find some food, they will leave. They understood that when Jesus says go, the people know that he's done teaching for the day. And if he's done teaching, then they won't miss anything. But Jesus tells them, tells them to feed the people rather than sending them away hungry. Now how cool is this? I mean, think about this. Jesus has been teaching the people what it looks like to believe in God and live as his follower. He's taught them with words and he's taught them by showing them. But this miracle isn't about Jesus. It isn't about him. It's about hungry people and the disciples' obedience. So the guys go and collect the five loaves and the two fish while they're, and while they're doing that, Jesus has everybody sit down. Then after he gives thanks for the loaves, he gives them to the disciples to give to the people. Verse 19 says, And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. I'm not sure if anyone else sees this the way I do, but I see it as a training session. Jesus is giving his followers the next lesson on how to give and how to put their faith into action. He's moving them past the watch me do this phase to the you can do this phase. And verse 20 says, they all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. This is a pretty great way to preach, right? Or teach, whichever way you want to take it. I mean, the people who follow Jesus have spent close to three years listening to him and watching him. They don't have any doubt about who he is or what he can do. They're not questioning his abilities to move things or to change things or even to raise people from the dead. They are not questioning. I mean, they've heard him preach multiple times and they've watched him put his words into action. They know without a doubt that he is who he claims to be. And they're even coming to a place where they're willing to die for him. But this time, Jesus hands them the bread and tells them to give it 
to the people. And he just keeps handing out the bread for them to give to the people until everyone has eaten more than enough. Just like my family does at Thanksgiving dinner. Amen. Right? Man, let me tell you about Thanksgiving dinner in my daughter's house. I mean, we have turkey. And not just any old turkey either. I mean, my girls learn to cook from their mother. And their mother is a good cook. So we have homemade noodles and mashed potatoes and gravy. And I always struggle which one do I want on my potatoes? Anyway, and, 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 and we have stuffing and corn and green beans. And my mom moved to Florida this year. Did you know that? Yes. She, she's yes. going to suck it dash. Suck it dash is one of my favorite Thanksgiving meals. Thanksgiving side dishes. And everybody else tells me all the time, yeah, it's a great way to ruin a good batch of corn. But I love succotash. And my mom's bringing succotash this year. And they also have yams. I don't eat those, but they have them all covered up in marshmallow. They look really good. And a big, big spread of desserts. Right? And, and because our older daughter married a guy who was raised on Greek food, we always have some Greek appetizers, which, by the way, I tend to fill up on before we ever get to the end. <laughs> but do you know what I like best of all? Some of you might already be catching on to this, but I'll tell you just in case. My favorite part of the Thanksgiving dinner is the leftovers. It's just, it's the leftovers. I know it's crazy, but I really like to warm up the leftovers and eat Thanksgiving dinner at least a few more times. One year, not too long ago, the cooks decided to stay closer to what would actually be needed for our dinner. And the result was that we didn't have any leftovers. I was seriously bummed out about that. I want you to know. And because I'm a grown man who could do what I want, I whined enough my wife went out and bought a turkey and some leftover and some of the some of the fixings that go with it and made me a whole other Thanksgiving dinner that I could put in the refrigerator and let become leftovers. So that I, she's a pretty good wife, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I agree, Stacey, I agree. The, the passage that we just read says that after the disciples handed out the loaves and everyone ate all they wanted. They then picked up 12 basketfuls full of leftovers. Wow! And I was studying this scripture, and I was like, wow, what's, what's, what's the point of these leftovers? Well, I, I found this quote from Pastor Jack Graham. I don't know who he is, but he pastors the Prestonwood Baptist Church. And, and he, he said this. I guess that's a pretty big church from when I looked at their website. It looks like a pretty, pretty incredible place. But this is a quote that he had on there. And I, I just want to share it with you. He says this. One question I often hear when I talk about Jesus feeding the 5,000 is why were there 12 baskets full of food left over? And you know, there are so many ideas out there because 12 is such a common recurring number throughout the scriptures. There are 12 tribes of Israel and 12 disciples, both of which could explain why there were 12 baskets left. But I really believe that the 12 baskets of food were left so that each one of those disciples who participated could take one. You see, those who serve the Lord get to enjoy the fruit of the abundant supply that Jesus gives. Now, you don't have to be in full-time ministry to enjoy the blessings that come along with serving. God's rewards are for everyone who commits themselves to His kingdom work. You know who gets the most out of any message that I preach? I do. And the reason I enjoy it the most is because I put the most time into it. Without a doubt, the best way to grow in Christ is to serve Him and to give yourself to His purposes. If you want love, then give love. If you want friends, then be a friend. When servants share in God's service, 
they share in God's supply. Pretty good quote. And this, this quote interested me because I thought, as I thought about it, I realized that Pastor Jack has some things right. I mean, I don't know if the 12 baskets of leftovers went to the disciples, but I do know that you can't outgive God. I understand that when I serve someone, or many someones, I always end up receiving a blessing that I wasn't expecting. I've seen God move in ways I never dreamed He would move when I was obedient to His lead. And when I prayed for someone, or gave to someone, or fulfilled someone else's needs. And no matter how much I give, I always receive more back. That's why I keep saying we all need to be generous givers. God has so much more for us. He wants more for you as individuals, and He wants more for us as a church. He's calling us to do more, and He's preparing us to get it done. Remember that? that um, I want to see quick change. He's preparing us. He has something for us to do. He's preparing us to get it done. And all He asks of us is to be obedient. Of course, that kind of means He wants everything. But it doesn't mean that you won't have enough. You will never not have enough. I've tested these waters, and I feel safe saying He has always given me back way more than I ever did. So, this quote that was shared by Pastor Jack resonates with me because I believe all who are willing to be used will be blessed. Amen. The passage I shared today ends with verse 21. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. The miracle resonates with me because I know I'm a big vision guy. I know that. That's why sometimes I run you over. I don't do it on purpose. I just don't see you because I'm looking out there. And that's why I keep Barb real close because she grabbed me by the collar and says, Stop! I know. I'm a big vision guy. But that doesn't stop anything because I want you to catch this. Jesus has given his followers all they need so they can carry on the mission that he's given them. Now, he's had them put their hands to work as he supplied what they needed to do for a miracle to work, for a miracle to happen. And he doesn't have them do something small. Catch that? No way. Not small. He has them feed over 5,000 peoples, peoples, 5,000 people on their first real ministry-related hands-on miracle. What do you think he could do with you and I if we would seriously put our hands to work? What do you think he would do if you and I, if we seriously put our hands to work? He's calling us to do things, right? I think it's time for us to put Pastor Dale's message from last week to work. And get out there and start sowing seeds everywhere. Everywhere. Just throwing the seed all over the ground. Letting the soil decide to receive it and be changed. Because we are supposed to be sharing this message with everyone. everyone. Right. It's time for CC Naz to begin feasting on the banquet that he wants to give us. Will you commit?
to getting out there. Following his lead and then stepping up to the counter so that he can fill your place. Yes. Amen. As the praise team comes to lead us this morning, ask yourselves if there's anything stopping you from doing what God is asking us. What's stopping you from bringing someone next week? What's stopping you? I, I mean, you know, I was a youth pastor for a long time, and they would always say to me, well, pastor, all my friends are Christians. I believe that. So ask somebody that's not your friend yet. <laughs> right? Okay. I believe that. So ask somebody that's not your friend yet. What's stopping you? And if you can think of anything, anything that's stopping you from doing what God's calling you to do, realize that's Holy Spirit speaking to you today. And then, lay it down and move and go and do what He's asking you to do. These altars are open. You can come and pray anytime you feel like you need to. Let's sing.